And I will uh, to me this is a very uh, important uh, area which I've been working on for a long time which is staph infections and I will talk a little bit about uh, bloodstream infections including endocarditis uh, and some of the other parameters and the skin infections of staph so I would like to uh, uh, start with a series of slides can I ask for the uh, uh, slide set. Uh, can we start it, please? Uh, even without the pointer and Malish. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and start, and then. Uh, so we can. Uh, since we are a small group, the can added Maybe you want to come forward, so that we can. I can get uh, any questions from you or I can hear you when you ask questions. Uh, we are... Ma'am? Okay, so staphylococcal diseases, you want to go with the first slide, please. Uh, uh, and my purpose in presenting to you, I want to talk about the uh, novel antibiotics. Uh, I'm going to include uh, staph and strep, but uh, anti-gram positive antibiotics, because there has been a lot of new antibiotics that have come up recently, uh, and I want you to be aware of, besides vancomycin. So here in Egypt, Hinabi Masr, هل يترى الحاجات الانتي ريزيستنس موجود الفانكومايسين موجود هنا؟ It's available. Vancomycin is available. Uh, what I, so you have vancomycin available. It's a good drug, but how to use it? Uh, and I would, I would like to mention some other drugs that are out there just to be aware of. Uh, okay, first slide, if we can go ahead. فضلك. معلش لأنه حصل إيه؟ الجو وحش. We're doing good. Great, I have the... Uh, uh, okay, so I, I just want to tell you that uh, um, in general, uh, staph infections, uh, you all know, the, uh, um, we diagnose them as gram-positive coxine clusters versus strep infections, which are gram-positive coxine in chains, as you all know. And that includes the uh, all streptococci, including beta hemolytic strep and strep pneumo. Uh, the uh, uh, staphylococci are gram positive uh, in clusters, uh, but staph aureus is uniquely coagulase positive. So, part of coagulase positive, it is an invasive organism versus staph epidermidis, which is gram-positive coxi in clusters, but it's very much, they're both part of the skin flora, but staph epi is a very uh, avirulent or low virulence uh, organism, whereas a staph aureus is a, uh, is a very virulent uh, organism. Now, when we talk about uh, uh, staph aureus, uh, uh, through the years, uh, when first penicillin came out uh, in, in the, uh, after the Second World War in the 1940s, uh, penicillins were very active against uh, Staph aureus uh, and various other bacteria. So penicillin was the magic, uh, uh, magic antibiotics. Okay, can we start with the first slide or? Okay, where, where are we now? Okay, so the... Uh, well, why are you going forward? Why don't we go just first slide? Slide number two, that is. And, okay, next one. Okay, so we talked about gram positive oxide. Now, part of its invasiveness, it can cause, it's a leading cause now of skin infections, and it's leading cause around the world, around the world of, of uh, endocarditis. It used to be strep around the world, 
uh, with rheumatic fever and so on, but now around the world, even with community acquired infections, Staph aureus is a leading cause. Uh, also, because it's coagulase positive, it can cause septic thrombosis with all the catheters and the lines we use. Next. Next slide, please. So this is a recent data that shows that there are more people, for example, in the United States, if you look at the second bar graph, more people in the United States are dying of MRSA, which is the resistant staph aureus uh, to, and to, to the penicillins or beta-lactams, than there are people dying of AIDS, for example. And uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, so when it first uh, came out, uh, 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 how did the Staph aureus become methicillin resistant? And when we say methicillin resistant, it means that it's resistant to uh, oxacillin and to all the beta-lactam antibiotics. What we mean beta-lactam means the cephalosporins, all penicillins, uh, this is what the MRSA is. And it can be uh, the uh, Staph aureus, beta, it's a beta-lactamase producing, it started with the uh, beta-lactamase producing uh, Staph aureus uh, in the beginning. So it used to be susceptible to penicillin. But then the Staph aureus, you see, this is the incredible thing uh, uh, which we have in inherent in even the smallest organisms. They have defense mechanisms to fight back. Uh, and uh, it's, it's to, to many people, this is a proof of uh, uh, evolution. This is a proof of creation. It's a God created even in these very tiny creatures uh, some a way to fight back. So when we created penicillin uh, and we started using it, they started producing penicillinase, uh, which is beta-lactamase, penicillinase. They started using an enzyme that would hit the penicillin and it's like anti-aircraft. And this is how, so in order to become, overcome uh, 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 penicillin, uh, penicillinase, uh, we created a certain forms of penicillin, which is methicillin, oxacillin, nafcillin, the cephalosporins, uh, which would be, uh, uh, which are active. And then there was a mutation in the staph uh, to, uh, uh, there was a mutation in the staph, chromosomal mutation in the staph, to allow it to become resistant even to these active agents like oxacillin. And I won't go into much, but this is what we call as the uh, S-MEC, uh, which is producing a penicillin binding protein alteration where the, it binds there uh, and it became, we created the, uh, or actually came into being after that mutation, the oxacillin or uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus. You have oxacillin here in Egypt? Or nafcillin? I'm, I'm pretty sure you have one of those. Or, or cephalosporin resistant. So the penicillin sensitive uh, 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 Staph aureus came into being in, uh, soon after, within a few months uh, of, the, uh, uh, of uh, the use of penicillin. So resistance came, became very quickly. And the uh, mechanism resistance uh, was penicillin is producing. In the 1960s, uh, the, uh, with the methicillin being available, uh, the reports came back with methicillin resistant staph aureus. Uh, in two months, uh, in the 1940s, we had resistance to uh, the penicillin, uh, which is enzyme producing by producing penicillinase. But it really, uh, in few months after we produced the uh, active penicillins, that is the oxacillin, nafcillin, or methicillin, and within a few months, we started seeing the MRSA, the methicillin-resistant uh, form, which is the resistant form which we are concerned about uh, until, until now. So, uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, I, I'm having difficulty here. Okay, so what are the uh, penicillins now? So in the very beginning, uh, all penicillins or original penicillin G was active against staph. And then we created the anti-staph penicillin, which is oxacillin, nafcillin, methicillin. We also created another form of penicillin, which is ampicillin, which you have here available. That doesn't work against staph aureus, but works against some of the gram negatives, like uh, 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 but the, the uh, 
uh, Haemophilus influenza. We created the carboxy penicillins, which is carbonicillin, to work against Pseudomonas. And more recently, we created the Augmentin, which is amoxicillin clavulonic acid, which works against the, uh, it works like the oxacillin against the staph aureus, the beta lactamase is producing. So we created different forms of penicillins, and not all penicillins are the same. Some work against the gram negatives, some work against the uh, somehow semi-resistant staph uh, that, we, well, that we have in the world of antibiotics. Um, and um, why is this? Uh, okay, so go back. Am I going in the wrong? Okay. I'm having difficulty here. Okay, so the oxacillin, nafcillin, uh, dicloxacillin, uh, these, uh, you, 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 I mentioned all of those, and the mechanism for resistance, as I mentioned, is a mutation of the penicillin uh, binding protein. The unique toxicities of nafcillin uh, is, is the fact that the nafcillin, which is, uh, we use IV, uh, is, causes neutropenia. Keep that in mind. And oxacillin can cause hepatitis. And they're both transient. Once you stop the antibiotic, uh, it, it resolves. Uh, then came, after we started seeing more of the methicillin resistant staph aureus, uh, came the uh, big antibiotic, which covers supposedly all the resistant staph, including MRSA, uh, vancomycin. It's a glycopeptide antibiotic, mechanism of action, so this, when you give it, you're covering even the resistant form, the most resistant form, which is methicillin resistant, and it, it inhibits the cell wall synthesis, uh, the peptido of the peptidoglycan, by binding on the D-ala, D-ala, D-alanine, D-alanine, two proteins, so it inhibits the bacteria from being able to build its cell wall, and hence it kills it. Uh, and it's commercially available since the 1960s, and it took a while for resistance to occur. Uh, over the years, resistance started occurring uh, more frequently, uh, and for example, uh, uh, but, but it covers all the gram positives, except few gram positives, like lactobacilli, uh, the uh, leuconostoc, uh, pediococcus. These are extremely rare and you have to be a microbiologist. But in general, vancomycin covers all gram positives. And even if you take it air, uh, orally, it covers Clostridium difficile, which causes diarrhea, which is antibiotic associated diarrhea, because C. difficile, Clostridium difficile, uh, is a gram positive organism. It covers the bacillus species, the Corrine bacterium. And, uh, but now we're finding even resistance to vancomycin. And this is its, uh, so the bacteria found a way to do another mutation, and it replaced, uh, replaced uh, D-alanine, D-alanine protein in the cell wall, it started making D-lactate, D-alanine. See, it's amazing how they, they found a way to kind of fight back. Uh, you know, uh, God give, has given them that kind of a, uh, to me, I'm amazed, uh, because I respect these uh, bacteria, they're my enemies, uh, the pathogens, uh, but uh, God has put in them a way to fight back uh, to be able to survive, uh, like the other uh, species we have in the animal kingdom, uh, uh, very, very much so. So if you think about it, uh, first uh, penicillin came out, it was active against all Staph aureus, and then we had the first stage, uh, as you can see on, this, uh, on the diagram, uh, we had, ooh, uh, so what happened, I sort of, how oh, we can go back? Oh, sorry. Okay, we're back, we're back, okay. All right. All right. Uh, there we are. Let's hold it for, yes. This is my least of my concerns at this point. The most important thing is to uh, get to my slides. This uh, slide uh, pointer or whatever is like driving in Lebanon. Uh, 
which a certain art which I really lost. Okay, so how can you move this slide forward? Can you move slide the next slide from your side? Okay, now, so here, the, the first resistance me mechanism of resistance came to penicillin and we created a penicillin, or actually uh, came into being in the 1950s, a penicillin resistant staph aureus. Then came the anti-staphylococcal penicillins, which are methicillin, oxacillin, nafcillin, all right? And then when we used those quite a bit and the cephalosporins, and we ended up with the methicillin resistant staph aureus. We call it MRSA or MRSA. It's a big problem here in Egypt, believe me or not. And, uh, uh, and then we came with vancomycin and we used vancomycin for years and we said, wow, this is a great drug. Use it and you can sleep well at night. It covers all the resistant, even the resistant staph aureus, the MRSA. But now we're seeing the vancomycin resistant enterococci, enterococcus, which is a gram positive. And now we're seeing the vancomycin intermediate resistant uh, staph aureus. We call it the visa. Initially, they called it the visa. And the visa people, the, the, with the credit card, the visa people were very upset for a while. So then, because it's a glycopeptide antibiotic, they changed the name to Giza. And then the Egyptians got upset because of Giza, the tourism, that it's, uh, they call the bacteria like the Giza. So now they call it Visa, we came back, uh, not to make anybody upset. And, uh, but this is uh, one of the things that happened uh, a decade ago. But now they call it still, they call it vancomycin intermediate susceptibility uh, staph aureus. I covered this, but you know, in 1948, penicillin resistant came, uh, staph aureus came into being. 1961, we saw the first classic MRSA. Do you know where was it reported, the first, the first organism around the world? You should know that question. MRSA, MRSA. The first report came from which part of the world? The big city. Cairo, Egypt, yes. Namro reported the first case. So you are responsible. This is why you should not be upset if they call it Giza. Uh, so this was the first report. This is the first information. 1975, in the United States, we started seeing the methicillin resistant, more methicillin resistant staph aureus. Then came Bactroban, you know, Mupericin, they put it as an ointment, and then resistance developed to it. 1996 is when we saw the first Visa the vancomycin intermediate susceptibility. And in 2003, we saw the complete resistance uh, started emerging of vancomycin resistant staph aureus. So I just want to tell you that uh, staph aureus is a skin organism at the end. But how does it get introduced into the blood? The most common cause of introduction to blood is all of the things that we do to break through, uh, connect the skin into the blood. For example, the IVs. We put a lot of IVs, peripheral IVs now, and they put a lot of central venous catheter. And we realized it's a major source of Staph aureus bacteremia. We call it catheter-related Staph aureus bacteremia, or catheter-related uh, bacteremia. So, and this has been an area, Dr. Hashim helped me a lot, of great interest for us. We were the first people in the United States. We coated this, uh, uh, found a way of how we can coat this uh, uh, catheters with antibiotics. And uh, Dr. Amanda, I would like to send you some coated anti uh, catheters, central venous catheters, because really it would reduce the risk of infection completely in a, in a major way. Uh, now there are seven studies, but there is just uh, a few months ago a big study in pediatrics in England, 500 in each arm, showed that these are the most effective uh, catheters. And this was based on the uh, work we initiated uh, in the United States. Now the CDC recommends them to use them in the ICUs uh, or in high-risk patients uh, in order to prevent, uh, uh, prevent infection. Now here, okay, perfect. So now it's part of the recommendation of the Center, Center for Disease Control in the United States. Um, and uh, this we, we received in 2009 the Sepsis Award. We received multiple other awards. You see with me here uh, Dr. Hashim right next to me. He's on the board of home, uh, a lovely uh, Rafi Hashim, we call him Ray Hashim. Dr. Anne-Marie on the far right, 
and Marie Shaftari was a good friend of Dr. Nina, and she's very much involved with home, and they're, they're, all of them are at MD Anderson. Uh, now, uh, so the, the other thing is when you introduce it into the blood, it can cause bloodstream infection, and one of the things is endocarditis. The most common cause of staph aureus endocarditis are catheter-related infections. And actually, 12% uh, of these bacteremias, once it causes bacteremia, which is bloodstream infection, uh, you end up in 12% of those with endocarditis. But if you have a prosthetic valve, you have 40% chance that there's almost half of them will end up with endocarditis, and very difficult to treat when you have prosthetic valve. If it's a staph aureus, you have to remove the prosthesis. And the clinical uh, exam is insufficient to exclude infective endocarditis. In the past, we look at Osler nodes and all of these things. These are classic things, but uh, at this point, most of them, they don't have these. You have to do a transesophageal echocardiogram. At least an echocardiogram, which is transthoracic, but the best one is transesophageal. Now is the standard of care. Now, also, th almost 3% of those who end up with bacteremia would end up with osteomyelitis. And this is very common because if you don't treat it long enough, if it's line related, you should treat for two weeks with IV antibiotics. And if, it is, uh, if you think that the patient is not responding the first 72 hours, you should treat for four weeks. So it is a long duration of therapy. And many times, a lot of physicians, when they have it in the blood, and they give antibiotics by day four or five, the patient is afebrile, smiling. You see, it's very tricky. They stop the antibiotics. They give a week, maximum five days. The patient comes back with osteomyelitis or endocarditis. It needs a lot of treatment. Why? Because this bug hides in either the spine or in the valves of the heart. And unless you give several weeks of antibiotics, it comes back with vengeance. So you inhibit it in the bloodstream. The patient is afebrile, is smiling. Yalla, ba'tu al bayt. Send them home. And you send them home, they come back with either endocarditis, 12% chance, 3% chance osteomyelitis. The other thing is epidural abscess. Now, this is very tricky because they come back, uh, they had a staph aureus bacteremia, and they come back and they tell you, doctor, I, I have, I'm, I'm not able to stand up. I have leg weakness. Uh, elderly person, incontinence. You think, well, they have maybe disc disease. And you look there, you find an abscess, which is an epidural abscess. And this can be diagnosed only by MRI. It's second most common cause in the United States of medical malpractice, because a lot of people miss it, especially in the elderly. And they dismiss them, oh, and like disc, uh, go, uh, go take some brufen, uh, you know, ibuprofen or something of that sort. Now, the other parts, the other complication that you should be uh, aware of uh, is uh, other uh, deep-seated infections. They just started. No, I need Akhtar, please, because it took Alashani. I'll give you some antibiotics for a month after I finish. Uh, symptoms depend on organ involved. The brain, you can get brain abscess, the psoas muscle infection, renal abscess, so all of these, it can cause disseminated disease, so don't take it uh, very, very lightly. Uh, the other thing is complicated bacteremia, which is septic arthritis, so it can, can hit. People have arthritis, it can go and reside in the joint. And septic arthritis, uh, uh, it's, it's quite common, to be honest with you, uh, and it starts with knee pain, and then what you need to do is put a needle there, and you can make the uh, diagnosis. Uh, then the other thing is embolic events. So the catheter would uh, have a thrombus around it, and it would shoot emboli to the lung. And it's these are like pulmonary embolism. You know what pulmonary embolism. But these are septic emboli uh, with infarction. So staph aureus can be, in the blood, a very dangerous thing. The other manifestations are the skin infections. In children, there is a staphylococcal toxin-mediated uh, disease. Um, uh, there are all sorts of the scalded skin uh, syndrome. Uh, remember also, by the production of the enterotoxin, you can get an acute diarrhea with it. And it's common. And it occurs within six hours, 
you eat uh, shawarma or you eat something like this and you'll get gastroenteritis, usually it's vomiting. Very common is to be a staph aureus. So it has multiple different forms. In the GI, it could be the enterotoxin producing food poisoning. The typical question you get it in USMLE is somebody, they were on the plane and it is uh, flying overseas over the Atlantic and everybody ate and then all of a sudden everybody is vomiting. What is the organisms? They give you E. coli, whatever. No, it's staph aureus because within six hours. The plane took off, they served the meal at nine, uh, uh, nine, uh, uh, 6 p.m., they all started vomiting around 12, within six hours, 12 midnight. So these are the, but then there is a large number of skin infections. In Pataigo, uh, there is deeper, if you go deeper, subcutaneous, it's a lymphangitis. Deeper into soft tissue is necrotizing fasciitis where you need to do surgery, and the myonecrosis. In fasciitis and myonecrosis, you need a surgeon like Dr. Amanda to cut in because you need to release the toxins. So you can't just, cellulitis, you can't treat with just antibiotics. So these are the general sort of uh, guidelines. This is empatigo, the typical thing you find in the children, and usually it's the yellow, crusty material. So when it's crusty, this is empatigo. Uh, this is cellulitis. And you see cellulitis is usually, the borders are not well demarcated. It's red, but this is the one that you have to treat. Often you have to treat with oral cephalosporin or agents. Unless you have a high rate of MRSA, then you have to give IV vancomycin. Uh, the purulent cellulitis is what you see here. When you have purulence, pus coming out, it's always staph aureus. It's always staph aureus. Erysipelas is more strep. But the hemolytic strap, why? Because you see how beefy red it is, and the borders are demarcated. The borders are demarcated. And uh, there are all sorts of classification, which I will jump over. So these are the skin infections. You need to have incision and drainage if it is, there is an abscess, or if it's a deep infection, fasciitis, where, where a CT scan shows you have fasciitis. Uh, if it's over uh, two or three, in diameter uh, or febrile or toxic, blood cultures are positive, uh, then you have to have an intervention. Outpatient, you give an abscess, uh, you have to drain it, uh, and you give an antibiotic. And if you suspect strep infection, do not use, use Clinda and do not use Bactrim. Do not use Bactrim or doxycycline. This is necrotizing fasciitis. Deep-seated infection, life-threatening, and you need to cut in because the toxin release. And really, MRSA is a big problem. This is one of the reports uh, almost 10 years ago where, where really it shows, uh, you see in Time magazine, they wrote in 1966 that they expect by the year 2000, all bacterial infections and viral infections will be eliminated. Um, they thought that we'll be out of business. We're busier than ever as infectious disease doctors. So these are some of the, we're seeing more, more of the mesicillin resistant and we started using, like in the ICU, this is a CDC report, 60% of the staph aureus are methicillin resistant, and they are associated with higher mortality. I won't go into much of this, but I want to tell you a little bit about the newer antibiotics. Vancomycin, uh, we found it has, now the more we use it, the more resistance we're going to generate, and, and the problem is, the big problem we have is that uh, uh, many times the reports is that it is susceptible, but if it has MIC more than one, if you don't know the MIC, and its MIC is more than one, the response is not good. It's like 50% response. You have to have a very good MIC. MIC means minimal inhibitory concentration. The problem in many of your hospitals, they would just tell you susceptible or resistant. And I don't know if you do susceptibility to start with, uh, you do susceptibility, don't you, in the hospitals when you send for cultures? But do you get the exact number of the MIC? If you don't, this is why some concerns now is what if the MIC is equal to two, which is susceptible? The response is not that good. What do you do? What other alternatives? Trimethoprim sulfa, uh, you, uh, uh, you don't use it if you're thinking of strep because it's not the best drug. It can work as an oral antibiotic 
for staph aureus and even for MRSA, but, but in mild infections. Severe infections, you have to use vancomycin, uh, but, if you, uh, but if you're suspecting staph aureus, uh, strep with a staph aureus, mixed infection, use a beta-lactam, which is, if it's susceptible, or clindamycin. Uh, uh, trimethoprim sulfa, don't use it if you have a serious infection with staph aureus. Use it on mild infection. And uh, what other possibilities? So what are the older drugs? Don't use rifampin alone. Rifampin, we use it only if you have a foreign device. If you have prosthetic joint and it's staph aureus, and you cannot remove the prosthetic joint. If you have a prosthetic valve, use rifampin with vancomycin. But don't use it alone because resistance can develop very quickly. Trimethoprim, you can use it with rifampin in oral, but in milder skin infection. Clindamycin is a good drug. And if you have minocycline or doxycycline, is a good drug. You can use it with rifampin. And they could be a good drug, but usually for soft tissue because they are static drugs. They're not sidle. There are not a lot of newer drugs. But uh, if, if they're not available to you, I don't think I, uh, I will go much into them. But I, uh, I don't know if you have any of those. Linazolid, do you have, do you have linazolid? Yes. Ah, so Pfizer got linazolid. And do you have daptomycin? So linazolid is available. So I'm going to concentrate then, uh, which on the list besides, so which, tell me which ones do you have? Quinipristin, delphopristin, synersid, do you have it? Most likely not, because in the United States we're not using it. So you have linazolid. Do you have uh, tedizolid? No. And it's, it's not used. Daptomycin, which is out. Dalbavancin? Okay, I'll tell you a few words about Dalbavancin. And telavancin, we just started using it. And ceftaroline. Okay, so I'm going to skip some of them which you don't have, but the exciting ones uh, we, need to, we need to tell you about. Uh, uh, clindamycin, when can you use it? 80 or more uh, of the MRSA are susceptible to clindamycin. It's a good drug to use. But remember, if you use it for a long time, use it on mild infection, not in bloodstream infection. I, you see what I'm saying? Uh, because it's, uh, but it works against MRSA. And it covers uh, beta hemolytic strep. So when you're in doubt, clindamycin is a good choice. The problem, if you use it for a long time, you get C. difficile, the antibiotic-associated diarrhea. So don't use it for a long time. Many times with dentists, it's a good drug. They give it clindamycin. But don't use it for more than a week, especially older people. And it can induce resistance. So this is, we talked a little bit. The doxycycline, by the way, an antibiotic, it's good for MRSA. You have to use it twice per day. But it doesn't cover strep. So if in a skin infection, if you're not sure, but if it's, you think most likely staph, I would use it, doxycycline. So these are some alternatives that are available to you. Equinopristin, let me tell you about linazolid. Linazolid is a new antibiotic, and it covers MRSA, and it covers the vancomycin-resistant, VRE. So it's a great antibiotic. It's available IV, and it's available oral, and you can give it twice orally. Make sure they're not on antidepressants because it's uh, serotonin, it increases the level of serotonin. You see, when the, and if they are, uh, they are on any antidepressant, uh, serotonin synth synthesis inhibitor, uh, uh, if it, uh, they will work together and you'll get very high level of serotonin and you get serotonin syndrome. So they, they get rigid and they get fever and they become may uh, have mental status changes and so on. But it's a very good antibiotic, minimal side effects. The other thing, one of its side effects, but it's actually for pneumonia, it's excellent right, compared to vancomycin. For pneumonia, particularly hospital acquired pneumonia with staph aureus with MRSA, it concentrates on the lung. So it is one of the drug of choices to use it IV for pneumonia, MRSA with pneumonia. Uh, uh, or any form of staph aureus pneumonia. Keep in mind, after two weeks of usage, it can would have your platelets, the platelets of the patients would go down. So they will not bleed, but it cause thrombocytopenia and possibly anemia. We were the first to show that if you give them vitamin B6, they will not get the anemia. So keep that in mind. 
But it's not good to use it for bloodstream infections. It's good to use it for pneumonias because it concentrates volume of distribution, concentrates in tissues, and it's good to use it in skin infections. But, all right, so when you take it, the linozolid, it concentrates in tissues, not in the blood. So vancomycin should be the treatment of choice for the blood and not, uh, uh, not linozolid. But for tissues, it's excellent, and it covers MRSA and even vancomycin-resistant organisms. But it's expensive. I think Pfizer is producing it. Daptomycin, I'm not going to talk much about it because we don't have a lot of time. And let me uh, tell you a little bit about a drug which uh, came out in the United States, is Dalbavancin. Very interesting. You give it once per week. And now we're doing studies on it. It maintains high levels in the blood and in tissues, much higher than vancomycin. And we were the first to show that it is superior. It's excellent for skin infections. You just give a shot one gram per week, and then the next week you give 500. You bring them to the clinic, you give them a shot, and they go home. It covers MRSA, it covers strep, staph. We were the first to show in a, in a study, this is a study I published, 2005, a good time, 12 years ago, it was superior than vancomycin for bloodstream infections. So whether skin infections or bloodstream infections, it's an excellent antibiotic, especially if you can't bring the patients for follow-up. You see what I'm saying? You give them one shot, bring them in a week, you give another shot. For staph aureus, it's excellent. If it's staph, uh, so now it's approved for even skin infections, and we're doing, uh, we were the first to show in blood infections to be excellent. The uh, televensin I will not talk about, and I will end with this uh, very incredible antibiotic, which is called uh, ceftaroline. Ceftaroline uh, is this one. Ceftaroline is the only cephalosporin on the face of the earth that covers MRSA. Usually, all cephalosporins are not active against MRSA. All penicillins, all beta-lactans, penicillins and cephalosporins. This is the only one, a third generation cephalosporins, which is like ceftriaxone plus vancomycin. Actually, when they compared it to vancomycin plus ceftriaxone, rosefin, it was as good as both. Covers all, all the gram-negatives except pseudomonas, and it covers the gram positives. Usually the dose is twice IV, 600 milligram, Q12 hours, and in, if you suspect endocarditis or a complicated staph infection, uh, 600 milligram every eight hours. It's a very, very interesting, and it's approved for skin and soft tissue infection now. We're using it for bloodstream infection in our situation. It's very well tolerated, very nice uh, drug, and it's a pleasant addition. Now, so we have quite good options. Uh, cephalosporin, uh, like vancomycin plus, in which you can put them on it, or delbavancin once you send people home for outpatient therapy. And this is all what I have uh, today. Uh, let me take just a few questions, and we're ready to go. If you have any questions, we finished. And thank you very much. I, uh, as I promised, I'm going to have some antibiotics. I'm going to give it to my dear brother here. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, it is used in, in, in pediatrics, uh, and, uh, uh, but you have to adjust the dose, uh, as you well know. But uh, in our place, we're, we're using it in pediatrics. We, we, we can use it in pediatrics in some resistance. But uh, its main usage is in adult medicine. You have to adjust it. I'm, I'm not sure, because I deal with adult medicine, but you have to adjust. Obviously, the oral dose is less, and the IV dose. We can't use the 600. Yeah, I think, so. uh, first of all, I want to thank you for this gracious lecture. Thank you. Uh, and also, may I ask you about the decaution? I need to know uh, why uh, the striking antibiotics to avoid resistance. Yes. Uh, and the last point, I want to ask about the lime. The lime, yes. Really? So I want to ask if, 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 if there are some precautions like that. Yes. 
Very interesting. You're using it uh, quite a bit. Okay. So let me tell you about resistance. Don't use it unnecessarily. We found uh, the, the terrible thing that's happening with all antibiotics is we use antibiotics like vitamins. And especially here in our part of the world, the pharmacists uh, give antibiotics. And you have somebody with a cold, they give them antibiotics. Cold is usually with viral, running nose. There is no uh, bacteria that gives you a running nose. It's usually a bad, vi you know, they say they're coughing. I understand. Now, so don't use it with a common cold. Now, I understand if they have influenza or para-influenza, this influenza or para-influenza, if the patient did not have the vaccine, for example, for influenza, can pave the way for staph aureus pneumonia. I understand that is after the cold, there might be a possibility of superimposed staph aureus infection, so use something. You can use whatever. If there is a high rate of, uh, you can lose the nasolid, or you can use other things uh, for, the, for, the, for the cold, azithromycin, uh, for strep. Uh, you can use other stuff. Uh, I use, you can use tetracyclines or something of that sort. But, uh, but don't use antibiotics haphazardly, especially for upper respiratory tract infections. Don't use it unnecessarily for a long time unless you have a bloodstream infection. So these are the very important criteria. Linazolid, you have to be cautious. Use it, but use it judiciously. And this is very important. Because we found now a high rate of resistance for linazolid among both the vancomycin-resistant enterococci and among the staph epi, the methicillin-resistant staph epi. So linazolid, if we, if we develop resistance to linazolid, yani it's, it's really not good. Okay, the other thing is with MRSA, people with MRSA, make sure you wash hands, you use a special uh, garb in contact with them. We can easily can get onto your white coat or to your clothes and you can transmit it to others. So contact isolation is very important. Yes, sir. It's a lab diagnosis, you can't tell. You have, once you have the culture, they need to do susceptibility for oxacillin, or nafcillin, or methicillin. And if it's resistant to cephalosporin, it's a MRSA. Because MRSA is resistant to cephalosporins, all the penicillins, so you know that it's MRSA. Any other questions? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, three days might not be enough. It depends on what, uh, what kind of infection. It's a good idea, but uh, and actually studies, uh, if they've been on antibiotic for a good while, uh, especially with deep-seated infection, they can st remain febrile and the cultures like blood cultures would remain negative for almost a week. So uh, it's a tough thing. But it's better than nothing, I mean, to kind of... Uh, any other question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, How do we justify to use the lenazolid in the environment of acute clinical tonsillitis? In recurrent uh, tonsillitis? Uh, no, not, uh, not exactly. You have so many other possibilities with tonsillitis in children. If you're going to use it in recurrent uh, and you're suspecting a possibility of staph, although usually there it's most likely a strep, which is kind of recurring because of inadequate treatment or resistant organism, then uh, use it uh, judiciously for seven to ten days, not for a very long time period, and see how they respond. Very good. Well, thank you very much for your attention, sir. One last question and then we we'll stop. Yes, I mentioned if they are on uh, MAO inhibitors or antidepressants that would increase serotonin, you should not use linazolid. And you should always check if there are any antidepressant which would increase the level of serotonin, like MAO inhibitors or any of these 
antidepressants, you should not use uh, linezolid because you can have a serotonin syndrome, which could be serious. All right. Or if they are extremely very low level of platelets, if they are leukemia patients with a platelet count less than 20,000, don't use linezolid because it can suppress their platelet down, they can bleed. All right, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.